how, how come, and especially with the bar school, how do you find the experience of training someone, them getting goods, and them leaving? I still remember parents calling me up and said, look, the son of mine is useless, can you teach him bartending? Can we, can we explain to the people watching what is an Indian wedding? A very simple, average Indian wedding. I'm talking about a very middle-class Indian wedding would be almost like four functions, which means at least spread over four days. Hello everybody, welcome back to Bar Talks. I am here joined by Mr. Yangdab Lama. This is the way I've described him to other people as uh, a living Indian version of Gaz Regan that is actually able to speak. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the major reasons I wanted to speak to Yangdab is because considering everything, is, uh, everything here is coming to a point where we're at a cocktail revolution per se in India, and you are the forefront of that with Sidecar, one of the few independent owned bar own, bartender to bar owner bon, own bars. Here we are. We are in the library bar at the Leela Palace, a great amazing place. We're having dinner later today. Fantastic bar this. 26 years in the industry. And then how old is Sidecar? Sidecar is three years old. Yeah. So how the hell do you stay 26 years in the industry, open a bar three years prior, and boom, next thing you know, the bar is in one of the world's 50 best bars, for example, and you stay motivated and stay happy and stay this good looking, uh, <laughs> <laughs> considering. Yeah. I, think, I think it's also about, you know, living one day at a time. In, in my case, when I started, I didn't have a definite plan, right? So it was, so I, I keep telling people, whenever somebody says, how did you become a bartender? I always say, I'm an accidental bartender because I've had a hotel school background. So the idea was to become a hotelier. Mm -hmm. So you, you join the hotel in the food and beverage service and I was sent to the bar. And then when I was working in the bar, as a not behind the bar, but on the floor serving guests, is when I would always look at the bartender and get fascinated with the fact that, oh, I, I would like to be one of, like, just like him, right? And that is how the journey started. But then as I progressed, you know, the first time I made a drink, it was a very memorable evening for me, probably one of the most happiest moments in my life as a young amateur hotelier. And then, it just started to progress, you know, it's just that I think also the fact that in India I didn't have a designation of a bartender. I was more of a waiter and then I was a bar captain. So I didn't have a designation of a bartender, but I was still working behind the bar, fixing drinks, being amongst guests. And I also kind of enjoyed the little attention that the guests would give you. Okay. And then, you know, what was also happening probably was that India was also opening up to the rest of the world. So when I started bartending, if you ever wanted to go to a bar, you could only get bars inside hotels. There weren't any good bars or restaurants outside the hotel. Well, why, why was it the hotels? Why was it constrained to the hotels? Purely because in India, you still have a very conservative culture, right? So eating out, drinking out was something that only rich people would do, right? Right, 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 right. Uh, so it was always considered a luxury. Uh, in, in our culture, until 25, 30 years ago, if you wanted to invite or meet up a friend, it was much more nicer or much more, you know, connected if you invited somebody over to your house, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. You never went for a drink with a friend over, you know, just to catch up to a, to a bar. If you did that, then you were rich. You were, you were somebody who had a lot of money. You could, you could, you know, splurge, all of those things. Even something as basic as just going to absolutely, a bar. Absolutely, absolutely. So you didn't have a go-to place. You just, you know, it was also a little bit about status. So therefore it was different, but then, with, of course, India opening up to the rest of the world, also globalization, the connectivity. I think very early on in the, in the, in the new millennium is when you could actually see a few bars and restaurants open outside of hotels. And that is when things started to change. Like I left my hotel, you know, life in mid 1999. Right, right, right. So four and, years into yeah. your career. And still the hotel didn't know what I was supposed to do because after four and a half years behind bars, uh, I was now going outside the hotels and I wanted to be a freelance bartender. I wanted to bartend in weddings. Wow. Uh, can, we, can we explain to the people watching what is an Indian wedding to give them some <laughs> scope, like how many days it is and how many people and how so, many drinks are you making over the course of that time? So Indian weddings, especially in this part of the world, which is the northern part of India where I come from, as in where I'm based at this point in time, 
there are no less than 500 people in a very average wedding. So you're talking about 500 plus crowd all the time. Just constantly? Yes. Okay. And then a very simple average Indian wedding, I'm talking about a very middle class Indian wedding would be almost like four functions, which means at least spread over four days of eating, Jesus drinking and merrymaking. Oh right? it's, it's a pure event. What I've realized is when people open bars or restaurants, they have a budget, they have a financial plan. When it comes to weddings in India, there's no budget. So it's a very important aspect. That is what kind of also worked in my, my favor because I was probably one of the first guys to get into that wedding space. Also, it gave a lot of popularity for the fact that, you know, you know, most of Southern Delhi got to know that there's a bartender called Lama. So 2003 is when I thought it was just the right time to start a bartending school. So in a very small setup, I started... Eight years in, that's eight years into the career. Exactly. So I, in, a, in a small little basement setup, I started off a bartending school. Here in Delhi? Here in Delhi. We started to offer a three month and a six month course, a certificate course in bartending, which did, did not still have a very formulated kind of a training thing, but we tried to bring in whatever we could through my experience. So, and then that's how I got involved with trainings. How do you find the situation of what I assume you've been raising bartenders for years, right? And every three years, generally, we go through like a new generation, right? There's some new kids come, they get very ambitious, they get very excited, then they win one cocktail competition and they maybe um, think they're the best, and they, <laughs> they, they get a humbling experience, and then sometimes they leave, sometimes they get over their pride and they start again. So. How, how come, and especially with the bar school, how do you find the experience of training someone, them getting good, and them leaving? Like, how do you approach that whole training aspect of, 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 of young young bikers? So for me, the whole experience has been very interesting because the first few years when I started a bar school and when people knew that they could come and learn bartending, the kind of people who came, the raw material that came to me to become bartenders were either school dropouts or there were people who were a pain for their parents so I, I still remember parents calling me up and said look the son of mine is useless can you teach him bartending even for parents even for the people who were wanting to learn bartending did not come with the purpose of becoming a bartender it was one other option they had in life where they could find a job my learning has always been that if you have and that's how I hire my bartenders I never look at the qualification experience I always talk to them one to one and I see if this guy is really interested in what he wants to do in life, whether it's bartending, whether it's waiting on a table, whether it's being a hotelier. And I've seen the guy kind of succeed uh, because he wants to be and he has he has the passion or the knack for it, right? I think that's, that's more important than his qualification or, or his background. I think that's the key. What, what was working with brands like in, when you started? Do you think that brands did a lot for the community or do you think it was just corporate interests and we were just a nice byproduct. I think the brands were trying to push their brands. So they were, they were definitely, it was part of their marketing campaign, right? But at the same time, it was also giving a lot of recognition to bartenders. Like, I still remember the BMGP, the Bacardi Martini Grand Prix competition. I used to, I, I used to be a jury with them, the technical jury. Wow, wow, wow. And what it did to a lot of young bartenders is suddenly you would get a few media coverage and it made them feel happy. You know, you're a young guy, you, you worked, very hard behind the bar, uh, guests would not recognize you. You were just another person behind the bar fixing a few drinks. And suddenly, you won a competition and you were written about. And then the same guest would come and say, oh, I read about you the other day, right? So I think the brands directly or indirectly did contribute to the fa fact that it was upgrading the whole idea of bartending and bartenders, right? So they did contribute. Also brand managers. I still keep saying this to, to my colleagues once in a while. I say, the brand managers who came in very early on, came from a different background. So even for them, he would get all the brief from, from the global you know, office, but he would not know how to take it forward because he himself never went to a bar and enjoyed a great drink or met a bartender. But today, that person is also evolved. Even the, bar, the brand manager of a Bacardi, for example, today, compared to the one that was there 15 years ago, there's a drastic change because today he's a cool guy. He goes to a bar, he knows uh, you know, his bartender. He knows what a good cocktail is all about. He knows what the consumer wants. So I think it is that change, right? So the, so the brands did contribute. At the same time, it was also the consumer who was being, the consumer was traveling, the Indian consumer, uh, when now traveling more extensively. 
Every time they were traveling, they were visiting bars and restaurants. They would come back to India, they wanted similar kind of cocktail experiences, similar kind of food experiences. Therefore, the pressure was on the bartender. So the bartender had to upgrade. The promoters of bars and restaurants had to upgrade. So the consumer was also kind of, in a, in a way, contributing to the whole idea of giving... The market decides what Absolutely. they want you have to give exactly. them. Like the vibe is the last 10 years we're going, India's going through this revolution. We are getting independent bars, we're yes. getting um, a whole new wave. Is, is it just like a, the planets aligning? Or was there like a moment that's kind of like sparked things a little bit? It's a little bit of both. Yeah, okay. You know? Because I think when you go through this transformation, there is a lot of things that happen. It's like there were a lot of bars that happened between 2000 and 2010. There were a lot of people who became bartenders, but kind of faded because the promoters of these bars were completely different set of people. I still remember people were opening bars in India, not because they were passionate about the F&B business, purely because uh, they had a lot of money. In India, there's something called page three, right? So it's like, if you're in page three, you're a celebrity, right? So, oh, okay, and what, so, what is on page three? So page three is this supplement that comes. Uh, right, right, right. It's, it's, it comes almost like every day. It's a week a newspaper supplement. Uh -huh. And if you're on page three of the supplement, it's called the page three people. Right, the page three people are supposed to be fashion designers, right. actors, actresses, Creative. celebrities, socialites, uh, right, right, right. and and a lot of people who had a lot of money wanted to be in page three. So they want, you want to be a page three person. Yeah. <laughs> and one you of the easiest way to be in page three was open up a bar or restaurant. So you do an opening party, you invite the media, and suddenly you're next, on page three. next day you're on page three, right? Was there moments, if, you, if you're willing to share, is yeah. there anything like that when you were like, this industry is, I'm, I'm, I'm tired, maybe I'm breaking, because what just happened in the last two years, so many people left. So many people left the industry because they don't see it as a, as a career or, or as a life choice. It, um, it happened to me very early on. Yeah. I left the hotels and I wanted to be a freelancer. I thought it was easy, it wasn't. So the next six months, I was completely unemployed. Mm -hmm. And I do not belong to Delhi. I come from a small little place called Darjeeling. So I'm living on my own. I had to pay my rent. So, you know, I had a little bit of savings that was being spent. I still remember trying to get back to hotels. I even went for an interview for a cruise liner. Right? So I was desperately looking for a job because I needed to survive in this industry. And I've been through that, you know, that six months of unemployment. But what it did is it kind of made me stronger, but I knew that the day I get an opportunity, I'm going to give it my 100%. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. is exactly what happened. So when I got my first call for a party, after six months of staying unemployed at home, wow. is when I gave it my 100%. And I think that kind of helped. Is it a wedding? Multiply this. It was a wedding. It was a wedding. I went to do a wedding party. It was the f so they booked me for the first wedding event. And because suddenly this, they, you know, they could all experience some great cocktails, I think they said, why don't you do the rest of our parties? There were three more parties lined up for the same wedding. That's a cool family. <laughs> That's a cool family. So, it was, so one party led to the next three, yeah. and then the other three then led to another 30. And, you know, 26 years later, where do you see yourself as part of this entire nightmare? <laughs> well, I think it's, we, are, we are definitely in the most interesting times, mm -hmm. you know, especially in the food and beverage space in this country, because like you said, great consumerism. So you have cities like Delhi and Mumbai, and then you also have theater cities, which is now coming of age. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you my story. You know, a lot of my friends who came from Darjeeling spent a lot of their initial career here and now have gone back. So they're taking back concepts, they're taking back ideas. Mm -hmm. And implementing those ideas in lesser known spaces, like, like I come from a small little town called Siliguri, right? Mm -hmm. It's not even tier two, it's tier four city, for example. But over there now, you suddenly see emergence of great bars and restaurants. Right, right. You know, which means that you've got to be really tough to survive. And then, of course, you know, in the, if you're in the alcohol space, uh, it's again, you know, you're fighting against the laws. You're trying to set it right. Uh, in a Hindi, you know, I, I, I used this word yesterday called jugar, which means you got to be somebody who is also manipulative at times to get your ways. You got to be clever, you got to be intelligent. So all of those things. Sly. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but it, it kind of is, is happening because, you know, now you see a lot of homegrown brands. Yeah. You also see younger people who are more experimental. You are also seeing the consumer that is changing. For me, the new India uh, is going to be a much more, you know, wonderful India. 
So India has a lot to offer. It's just maybe people don't even realize it. So mm. like, no, no, that's that's wonderful. I, I, having traveled so much, I've now stopped going like, oh god, oh, that country. I don't know anything <laughs> that's there. It's gonna be, ugh, you know. Um, Intricacies that you're speaking about different laws, just gonna stick that in there. There's no San Germain, so I put San Germain on the drink, <laughs> and then there's no sherry, so those limitations yeah. make you sort of more creative. So I did a Yang Dab Lama, I did a Mr. Yang Dab Lama. I uh, came to India before than everyone else did, just after the pandemic, and I was here early. Well, it's, it's wonderful that you're here early. Then, and uh, so nice to be a part of this uh, session, you know, talking about India the last 26 years my journey as a bartender and also the fact that you know that here we are in mm. new india and in india which is which is very promising and i'm sure we will see great bartenders great bars and a lot of interesting fnb concepts coming from india to the rest of perfect. the world perfect this has been bar talks with mr yangdam lama cheers and we're out thank, thank you, you. Bye -bye. cool that's it <laughs>